Welcome everyone and welcome to the, uh, to the Brexit webinar series organised by University UK International and the UK Government Science and Innovation Network. At these webinars we aim to keep you up to date on everything Brexit related and the impact for the higher education and research sector for the EU but also for the UK. This webinar, I'll have to tell you, is the last one of the series. Um, that is because at the moment, with the extension in place, we just want to update you today on what that means and what that means for the programmes and for migration and a whole lot of other things. But after that, there isn't really much that we could update you on. So that's why we decided for now, this will be the last webinar of the, web of the series. However, if at some point in the future we decide that we want to start them up again because developments have been um, going very quickly, if we have a deal or if something else happens, then we will start them up again and keep you up to date. But for now, it's the last one. And when we do start them up again, we'll let you know and you'll get the link and everything and we'll, we'll post it on social media and you'll, you'll get the latest information. As always, the slides will be sent to you after the webinar, as will a link of the recording on the University UK International YouTube page. So no need to, to, to worry, you'll get the slides. I'm Anna Mayamsa, Head of European Engagement at University UK International, and with me today is Francis Wood, who is Regional Director of the UK Science and Innovation Network Europe, and sitting next to me is Anthony Miller, Head of Domestic Policy and Communication at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And joining us from Brussels is Gosia Xerik, and I hope I, hope I pronounced the, the name correctly. She's European Advisor at the UK um, Research Office in Brussels. Um, Gossia will join us for the Q&A after the webinar, just like last time. Uh, so, as always, if you have questions, do send them in during the webinar and we'll pick them up at the end. Today we'll give you, as I said, an update on the developments with the extension and what that means for the different programmes. So, we'll talk a little bit about political developments, but then Francis and Anthony will dive into what the extension means for Horizon 2020. And I will do the same, what the extension means for Erasmus+, Plus, but I'll also touch upon other issues such as student fees, migration rules, um, and qualification recognition. As I said, as this is our last webinar, we really wanted to give you an update and a rounded overview of what is accurate right now. Um, so some of the information hasn't changed and will be a little bit of a repeat and some of the information will be new. I think the main message I'd really like to tell you today is to not stop your contingency planning for a no-deal exit just yet. I mean, we do have the extension in place. But we're not out of the woods yet, we're not there yet, and we, I know that the level of preparation between, um, for, between universities, both in the EU and in the UK, differs very much. So I'd say take these six months to continue your preparation, if needed, uh, so that if it would be necessary to use it, that you have it ready. Um, of course, we're all hoping it won't be the case, but um, if we do, it's not really an area where we can't be prepared. For more detailed information, those who've been watching us uh, previously know this, uh, look at our previous two webinars because they are really focused on no deal planning and what universities in the EU and universities in the UK can do in order to prep for a no deal. But that's not what we're going to do today. We're, today is really more of an update on where we are. So really briefly, what's happened the last couple of months. So the original exit date was March 29th of this year, and the UK and the EU had agreed to an withdrawal agreement. Now this withdrawal agreement guarantees EU citizen rights, so that means um, UK citizens living in the EU and EU citizens living in the UK would continue to be able to live with the same rights and responsibilities as they do right now. In addition, that withdrawal agreement would um, would create a standstill period, an implementation period, in which most of the things would stay the same. The UK would officially no longer be a member state, but would effectively continue to function like a member state. And that also means for our programmes, which are relevant for our sector, that the UK continues to participate in Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus until the end. After that, Theresa May uh, put the deal to a meaningful vote on the 29th of January and the 13th of March. And on both occasions, the agreement was voted down. Then on the 13th of March, the UK MPs, they voted against a no deal exit, after which there were two rounds of indicative votes. And these indicative votes were really about different options in ways the UK could collaborate with the EU in the future to see if there was any particular option that would really carry the majority in Parliament. 
However, that didn't happen, but I just wanted to um, give you an example of the options that the MPs chose uh, between. So one of them was a common market 2.0, which would have uh, entailed UK membership of the European Free Trade Association and the European Econ Economic Area, the EEA. And another option was EEA or EFTA, but without customs union. Customs union itself was tabled as well, and revoking Article 50, but also preferential trade agreements with the EU. Now, like I said, there were others as well, and none of them carried a majority in Parliament. In the meantime, the EU said that if the UK wanted an extension, they could get that on the condition that they would ratify the withdrawal agreement on the 29th of March, or before the 29th of March. However, on the 29th of March, the third meaningful vote took place and the deal was rejected again. At that time, Donald Tusk, who is the president of the European Council, called for a special European Council summit on April the 10th. And the way things stood at that point was the exit date was the 12th of April without a deal. Then on the 5th of April, Theresa May wrote to Donald Tusk asking for an extension and the EU27 gave the UK an extension on the summit on the 10th of April. Now, Francis, over to you, because Francis will discuss with you what that extension means. Okay, thank you very much, Anamai. Um, so, as Anamai said, on the 10th of April, the EU held a special European summit and at this summit, there was agreement between the UK and EU that Article 50 would be extended to the 31st of October 2019. So on the slide in front of you, you can see what the EU said in relation to this extension. And over the next few slides, we'll go into this in a bit more detail. So the main point to take from this agreement is that the UK remains a full member of the EU until the 31st of October, unless the UK government can pass the withdrawal agreement through the UK Parliament before then. Um, and this is really important to note that we can uh, leave the EU before the 31st of October. Uh, so yesterday, the UK's uh, Cabinet Office Minister, David Liddington, said that the UK would participate in European elections on the 26th of May, as there was no longer sufficient time to ratify the withdrawal agreement through the UK Parliament before the 22nd of May. So as you can see on the slide, the conclusion of last month's EU summit agreed by all EU leaders, including Theresa May, said that if the Brexit withdrawal agreement had not been ratified uh, in the UK Parliament by the 22nd of May, European elections would have to take place. Otherwise, uh, the UK would need to leave um, under a no deal scenario. Um, the ratification process, just to say a little bit about that, um, so the UK Parliament would have to pass a meaningful vote on the withdrawal agreement, which has not happened to date, um, and then turn it into UK law in the form of a withdrawal agreement bill. Um, so this parliamentary procedure does take some time, um, and so that is why we're now in the position of participating in the European elections. If the withdrawal agreement is passed and ratified before the 30th of June, uh, then the newly elected uh, MEPs will not take up their seats in the European Parliament. Um, and the European Council will review uh, the process uh, in June. So next slide, please. So looking now to sort of possible outcomes by the 31st of October, the UK government position remains that the UK, UK should leave the EU as soon as possible. Um, and as I mentioned before, the agreement at the Special European Summit allows for the UK to leave as soon as the withdrawal agreement is ratified. So effectively, the UK government has until the 31st of October to do this. Um, but the aim is still to leave as soon as possible and ideally before the new European Parliament convenes. Um, if we reach the 31st of October and the withdrawal agreement or another agreement which might have been agreed in cross-party talks in the UK is not ratified, the UK would then exit the EU without a deal. Um, the last point on the slide around the extension of Article 50, I need to make clear that this is not UK government policy. Um, we very much want to agree the withdrawal agreement, um, but it's up there to say that that is a potential outcome um, if we get to the 31st of October and the withdrawal agreement has not been agreed by the UK Parliament. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so there is a lot of guidance that is available. Um, I think many of you will have uh, read this already, but it's just worth reiterating that there is a lot there available on gov.uk, um, which covers no deal preparations um, around citizens' rights, student finance, data protection, EU funding, uh, mutual recognition of professional qualifications, travel to the EU. Um, there are also uh, specific living in country guides. Um, so this is for UK citizens who are living in EU member states. And I think here it's really worth emphasising that a lot of the agreements are done bilaterally between the UK and a member state on exactly uh, what the rules and regulations are around UK citizens living in a member state overseas. So it is really worth making sure that you've read the guide for the specific country that you are in. Um, so to give an example, uh, in Sweden, uh, the Swedish government has agreed to give um, a year, um, essentially from the day that the UK leaves the EU uh, to uh, put residence requirements in order. Um, but in Germany, currently, that is uh, three months. So it is really worth making sure that you've read those guides and look at what you need to do, what your staff need to do, what your students need to do um, in preparation for the UK leaving. Um, I think that's probably it from me. So I'll hand over to Anthony now. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks, Francis. So um, just to uh, recap, so um, obviously there is the, the, the chance that we may um, reach the 31st of October without a deal. Obviously, um, as Francis said, that's not the goal. We should have a deal. And, and if we leave with a deal, then uh, we can all continue or you can continue to participate in Horizon 2020 with the UK being treated as a member state. Uh, obviously, it's still the priority to reach that that deal. Um, but obviously, if we don't reach, there's still the risk that we are going to leave without a deal. Um, and in that case, uh, we've got to have in, uh, have in place our, um, our no deal arrangements. So if just skip to the next slide. So obviously, the, the key messages I want you to take away from this slide is that the government is committed to supporting uh, collaborative science, scientific research and um, innovation in the no deal scenario and Bayes has been working very hard with its uh, delivery partner UKRI to make sure they've got the necessary infrastructure in place uh, to deliver the, the guarantee and the extension to the guarantee. Um, another thing I might raise is that there's been a slight change in the terminology the government is using. So we are referring it to the, gar to the guarantee, not the underwrite or the underwrite guarantee anymore. There is absolutely no change in the policy. Uh, obviously, the guarantee uh, applies to those projects where the UK has been uh, successful ahead of uh, now the 31st of October um, in getting uh, Horizon 2020 funding. And the extension to the guarantee uh, covers all UK successful bids um, submitted after the 31st of October until the end of 2020 for those. Uh, projects which the UK can participate in as a uh, as a third country. So if we go on to the next slide. So yeah, I guess the key points uh, you know between the, now are that you should be carrying on as usual. Um, you know the the UK continues to be a member state and should participate in in projects in that way. Uh, obviously, there should be no sort of seeking to terminate contracts. Um, you know proactively or, or you know sort of. Um, uh, at this, uh, you know, um, in terms of UKRI, uh, they'll be delivering the guarantee on behalf of Bayes. Uh, with all the infrastructure is in place, uh, and they'll be using their existing um, sort of systems and infrastructure and payment payment mechanisms to deliver payments to the UK beneficiaries. Um, we'd still encourage, obviously, for people that haven't, or the UK participants that haven't registered in the on the portal to. Uh, make sure they are registered and that obviously if any new um, projects are uh, agreed between now and the 31st of October that you also register those on the portal. Um, obviously the, um, the another important point is the guarantee does cover the UK's uh, coordination costs. I think that might have been an area where there is, has been some confusion. So 
Um, I just want to reiterate that point. Uh, we also appreciate that in the extension period that um, there is still some questions about uh, the government's policy on really important uh, areas of research or grants such as the uh, ERC, uh, MSCA and SMEI. Um, we're going to be making further announcements about those in due course. Um, there are also a number of outstanding issues where we need to have discussions with the European Commission. Uh, we're still seeking to have those discussions. And um, during this period until the 31st of October, we're going, to, we're going to be updating our sort of technical notices and other documents to try and make sure that there's plenty of information out there and we're giving all the stakeholders the you know, confidence that the government will be delivering the underwrite should it be required in case of no deal. Thanks Anthony for that. And I will do similar things with explaining how the underwrite and how the extension now uh, plays into the Erasmus program. So basically at the moment we are a member state, we'll stay a member state until the 31st of October unless we leave with a deal earlier and that means that we will fully participate in Erasmus and we also encourage our EU universities uh, partners and our UK universities to keep working together and keep exchanging students while this is happening. Um, as I explained in the previous webinar, uh, when it comes to the underwrite in Erasmus, there are two scenarios at play uh, that are described in the guidance. The first is if we leave without a deal, then uh, the UK government will try to negotiate access to Erasmus for the remainder of the programme. And in case the UK government is successful, then the underwrite, the guarantee, sorry, the guarantee will uh, pay but basically for our, for our participation in Erasmus Plus for the remainder of the program. The second scenario in case of a no deal is that UK leaves without a deal, the government is not successful in getting access to the remainder of the Erasmus program, and then the guarantee covers less than we'd initially thought. It would only cover those um, projects that have already been ratified and signed, basically. So what, what, does that, what does that mean? Um, this is now extended until the 31st, so all the projects that you and all the mobility bits that you've submitted that are ratified before the 31st would fall under the underwrite in case we leave without a deal on the 31st of October. The underwrite covers uh, UK students abroad at the time of exit. That is always the wording that is being used at the time of exit. And now the time of exit is the 31st of October rather than the 29th of March. So UK students abroad at that point would be covered. Uh, they would receive their grants from, uh, from the UK government and wouldn't need to stop their, stop their mobility period. The underwrite again still doesn't cover any uh, new national funding or replacement scheme for Erasmus, so we wouldn't get additional funds to make sure that the levels of mobility stay at the level that we have them right now. Ongoing partnerships under Key Action 2 and 3 will continue to, uh, will be able to continue. You basically just uh, have to um, make sure that you demonstrate that your project is viable and that your European partners will continue to work on that project with you. And the government uh, Department of Education has put online some guidance on what to do there. I'll come back to that in a minute. Organizational support will also be covered by the underwrite, and it's really important to note that the underwrite only, sorry, the guarantee, the guarantee always uh, only covers funding for uh, UK organizations, which of course is particularly problematic for Key Action 107, which is international student mobility outside of the EU, where the UK university is responsible for distributing the fund to their international partners. The, the government is aware of this and we are working closely with them and we hope an announcement will come uh, on this issue soon. As I said, I promised to talk a little bit about what the Department for Education has put online in ways of how you can uh, make sure you get money from the underwrite and how you can prove that you have a project and that project will continue. Like I said, you, you, what you have to demonstrate is that you had a contract with the European Commission, that contract is now void, but you agreed with your European partners that you continue to collaborate and you continue to deliver on the objectives of the original project. So to be eligible, uh, the project must meet the eligibility cr criteria and you will be asked to provide evidence that you are a UK legal entity, evidence that your project was eligible uh, for funding with a contract in place, evidence of your successful bid, so that would be your grant agreement number, and confirmation of your bank account, sterling bank account. 
then if you uh, claim want to claim against the guarantee, you'd have to provide evidence of the following confirmation that EU funding has been withdrawn, a list of your UK and non-UK partners that are still in the project, uh, bilateral or multilateral arrangements still in place. And what you can do for this is use the confirmation of continuation form. This is online. I've got the links in the slides. You just need to click on them and then you're already there. This is the form that you fill in your partners and that is what the government views as evidence of those partners continuing the partnership with you. Um, and also, of course, the expenditure that you have incurred. And then, you, you know, of course, your EU funding contribution that you've gotten, the amount of pre-finance, what you've spent to date, um, and also what you would still expect to get and expect to spend. And for this latter point, again, it's important to note that it would only be about costs incurred by a UK organisation. So on the other on the other side, the European Commission also put some contingency measures in place. Uh, these were that students abroad on the time uh, at the time of exit will be covered by the European contingency measures, meaning that they can continue their mobility period abroad, will continue to get their Erasmus grants, and don't don't need to interrupt their stay. Um, we have been told by the European Commission they also use the wording exit date rather than a particular date. So this measure would also cover the 31st of October. If we leave without a deal before that or on the 31st of October, any student abroad at that point will be covered by the European Commission's uh, contingency measure. Now, really quickly to discuss uh, what has changed for the migration rules and basically nothing much, both in a deal situation and a no deal situation, all that has changed is dates and not the content. Um, so when it comes to a deal situation, um, no change in immigration status for those who arrived before the 31st of December 2020, those who already live in the UK or arrived before the 31st of December of 2020 can apply for settled status or pre-settled status. If you've lived in the UK for five years, you can apply for settled status and remain as long as you like. And if you haven't lived in the UK yet for five years, you can build up to those five years. In, in the meantime, apply, apply for pre-settled status. When you've got the five years, apply for settled status, and then again, you can stay as long as you like. Uh, the settlement scheme deadline will be the June, uh, will be June of 2021. And anyone arriving after the transition period in the deal scenario will have to apply for the new migration system that will be in place by January 2021 onwards. One thing that has uh, been updated or is, is, is new information is that EU nationals residing or living in the UK but temporarily living outside of the UK are now able to apply for pre-settled and settled status from uh, outside of the UK. So no deal migration rules uh, on the UK side. So again, the date is what has changed, nothing else really. If you've been in the UK before the 31st of October of this year, then the settlement scheme will be the scheme through which you can apply for settled status or pre-settled status. But then the application deadline will be brought forward to the 31st of December of 2020 rather than June 2021. And if you arrive, if an EU citizen arrives after the 31st of October, um, then the settlement scheme won't apply. Um, and uh, if you're arriving between the 31st of October 2019 and the 31st of December 2020, 2020 um, you should apply for European temporary leave to remain, which would allow you to remain in the UK for three years if you want to stay longer then you have to apply for the, uh, under the new skills-based migration system, which will start in 2021. We are asking the government to extend the three years because a lot of the courses at our universities are longer than three years. In Scotland, I think almost all courses are longer than three years and PhD often also are longer than three years. So we're asking the government to at least sell it to four years. Uh, in addition to that, um, I think last week an initiative was launched by Joe Johnson, the former Minister of Universities, and he's pushing for a change to the Migration Bill. He is pushing for um, the op opportunity for international students to work in the UK up until two years after they graduated, and at the moment the proposal is four months. 
So this, I mean, France has already covered this, uh, mostly saying that member state no deal migration rules is really something that is up to the member state. They determine what kind of rules and requirements UK nationals have to uh, adhere to. The European Commission has said uh, to its member states, you know, be be uh, generous, be lenient to these UK citizens that are residing in your territory. And again, if you want to know um, more for your country specific, the UK government has these living in guides, which I, I, I completely agree with Francis, is really worth having a look at and gives you uh, more detailed information. Then a couple of things that I wanted to touch upon as well, um, qualifications. So as you probably all know, you've got um, recognition of academic qualifications and you've got mutual recognition, recognition of professional qualifications. The first one's part of the Bologna process and that is something that we won't leave. The UK will remain part of the Bologna process. It's intergovernmental, it's not EU only, uh, which means that recognition of academic qualifications should be fine. And then the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, that is something that uh, is an EU directive and will change as soon as the UK is no longer part of the EU. However, the Commission has said that everyone who already has these professional qualifications and has them recognised, they will continue to be recognised in the future. They only advise that if you, if you, you know, want to be completely sure to consult with the national authorities to see if there's anything that you need to do. Um, in addition to that, the UK government has said that they want to make sure that EU nationals with uh, professional qualifications here will have means to have them recognised. And it's also interesting, I think, to note that individual member states can bilaterally or unilaterally recognise um, professional qualifications from a third country. So that could happen once we leave. Um, student fees. Um, EU students who want to study in the UK starting the coming academic year, so 2019-2020, uh, can, can, can do so under home fee status, so there won't be an increase in student fees and um, they still have access to the loan scheme. Uh, Scotland has announced pretty recently that they will uphold that as well for the academic year 2020-2021. And we are now still waiting for the other devolved nations for their announcements, so Northern Ireland, Wales and England, and we hope an announcement will be made uh, pretty soon. For UK students who study or want to study in the EU, um, check your relevant ministry website. Uh, we've been doing some digging to find out if there are already some countries that have given some information about what the fees will be once the UK leaves the EU. Uh, France, for example, um, the government hasn't made any announcement on projecting lower fees for UK students uh, and post-Brexit it's very likely that they would have to pay international fees, which is 2700 for a bachelor and 3700 for a master. Then in Germany, also there hasn't been an announcement made, however, the fee levels for EU students and international students are roughly the same, so even if Technically speaking, the law would change. It wouldn't have much impact on student fees. In Sweden, higher education is free for EU, EEA and Swiss students. And uh, it's likely that post-exit UK students would have to pay international fees. And they're quite a bit higher, they're 8,700 up until 15,000. In the Netherlands, interestingly, the Dutch government has said that regardless of a deal or a no deal situation, they're going to maintain a transition period. So under the end, until the end of 2020, they will treat UK students uh, as home fee students and they will continue to be able to study under the same fee regime that Dutch students do. So this is regardless of whether or not there actually is a transition period, but then after uh, 2020, so starting January 2021, it would depend on the type of residency permit students get, whether or not they'd have to pay international fees. Uh, it's likely, of course, that some will and some won't, but the, the difference is, you know, home fee status in the Netherlands is 2,000 and then international fees vary between 6 and 15,000. We have two FAQs on our website and the links are in the slides as well um, on, you know, questions that students might have about Erasmus, about student fees, about visas and the migration system. And it's both for EU students and EEA and Swiss students. So feel free to use that in your communication or for your own information. Then just a quick recap on um, the no deal, where are we? The assurances that we have, citizen rights, 
uh, the underwrite for Horizon, uh, but uncertainty for ERC. Uh, structural funds projects should continue until the end of 2020. Erasmus, as I said, current students and those abroad are fine. It's just the future uh, mobility that would be a problem. Um, EU student fees and loans, we need clarity from, uh, from the other devolved nations about 2020-21, but we have 2019-2020 uh, and nothing will change there. And for qualification recognition, uh, we, we have clarity that everyone who's got their degree recognised, that will continue to be so. Now, what we still need, no surprises there, um, clarity on the European uh, Temporary Leave to Remain system, funded backup structures for ERC and Marie Curie, clarity on the timeline and the focus of the UK Prosperity Fund, which is the UK version of structural funds, um, of course, funded backup structures for mobility, um, clarity for the 2021 EU student fee regimes, and uh, guarantees for the long-term professional qualification recognition. You all who've been watching, as you all know this scheme, uh, this overview, and no surprises, um, what I wanted to do, why I wanted to show it again, is that now we're in a time where we will be kind of refocusing our efforts. We'll continue working on a no deal, uh, prep work for our universities and European universities, but we'll also start focusing on the future relationship and what is important to our sector there. And of course, what we want, full association to rise in Europe, full access to Erasmus+, Plus, continued mutual recognition of professional qualifications, uh, being part of the European Investment Bank, if that is something that both sides want, but on the domestic side, of course, immigration system that allows us to attract global talent, um, increase support for outward student mobility and international research collaboration, maintaining regulatory standards so that our researchers can continue to work together, and a shared prosperity fund that, um, that, that is based on the expertise of, of, of universities. Thank you all for listening. It's been a shorter webinar than normally, but that's because, like I said, it's more of an update rather than uh, uh, going through everything again. You can look at our previous webinars for that. Uh, now I'd like to welcome uh, Kosia to join us for the Q&A. And maybe before we do that, Kosia, is there anything you might want to add to what we've just said? Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, so um, I just would like to maybe say that um, call for proposals will be still open in uh, both scenarios. The UK will be able to participate in most of them for Horizon 2020. So I would like to encourage everyone to keep the dynamic uh, in collaborations with European partners. And we have um, up-to-date information on our website. We have a two-pager uh, ACRO for Brexit fact sheet with links to all uh, informal, formal uh, information. So stay uh, up-to-date with our portal as well. Okay, thank you so much, Gosia. Yeah, and maybe uh, the first question uh, is, is, is a good question for you. Um, if we leave with a deal and the UK can still be part of Horizon 2020 funded projects, can the UK be also a coordinator of those projects? Uh, so just to, to double check, this question concerns a deal scenario, yes? Or no yes. deal scenario? Yes, they say deal scenario, yes. Yeah, so of course, in a this scenario, uh, the UK will have the same rights and obligations in uh, Horizon 2020 funding programs, so including coordinating uh, bids. Thank you. Another question is, what happens to the collaborative projects that don't have enough participants without the UK being in them? Maybe Anthony, you want to take that one? Or Francis? Well, look, I'm, I'm happy to. So, again, obviously the underwriter is there. Uh, the UK government is uh, ready and able to support the UK's participation in those projects, but we still need to have discussions with the European Commission to determine how they're going to be treated. So, um, yeah, we're still trying to progress those discussions. Okay, thank you. Let me look at other questions. Um, when will the higher education institutions receive Erasmus Plus grant agreements in order to sign and ratify the projects? Um, I think the timeline is not always uh, like based on one week, uh, but what I understood is that they should be signed and they should be ratified by June. Um, so as long as we are in, 
we are still a member state by if that happens by June, by the end of June, then all those projects in there, in case we would ever leave without a deal, would be covered by the underwrite. But I, I, as I understood it from my colleagues, the timeline that the Commission um, upholds is that in June the projects for Erasmus should uh, should be ratified. Next one. Um, Oh, sorry. Is there a deadline for entering the details on the grant management function? Um, as I, the grant management function is a function for Erasmus, and as I understood it, at the moment there hasn't been a deadline uh, placed on it yet. Uh, but I would assume, uh, but this is my guesswork, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it has similar deadlines to um, to the Horizon 2020. Um, you know, submittals for 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 um for the underwrite for the guarantee. So I would just uphold those similar timelines because the guarantee is something that operates across all programs. It's not just something for Horizon. It's not just something for Horizon 2020. So I I think you're safe by just uh sticking to to the timelines that we've mentioned for Horizon, similar for Erasmus. Then next question. For key action 107, if UK higher education institutions do not set money abroad to partner or participants, rather manage the function entirely within the UK, does this mean that we can still permit mobilities from partner countries to the UK, or is it likely that we can only fund for UK colleagues to go abroad? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, what we've been what we've been saying to the government is that key action 107. Um, you do distribute for your funds to international uh, parties. However, there isn't, as I as I understood it, a legal obligation to do exactly that. So by framing it as something that is uh, to the benefit of the UK partner rather than something that you distribute to international partners, it's something that we're hoping the government would still cover by the guarantee. But this is uh, this is something that we really have to wait for lines from the government on because they know this is something we're working on. It's just we don't we don't have an answer to that. Next question, um, key action 107 again. Um, Commission, you gave about the guarantee not covering funding for key action 107 projects already covered differs from the information given on 15th March webinar. Key Action 107 was covered. I'm not sure about that because this in Key Action 203, this may not be the case. I would like some questions. So I'm not sure about that. I'd have to go back to my own webinar, but I think I've always, I think as far as I know, the line, as soon as we've got confirmation about what the underwrite covers for Erasmus and it doesn't cover Key Action 107 was always not covered. What you might be referring to is that Key Action 107 is covered under the European Commission contingency measures. They cover 103, 107 and Erasmus Mundus. The difference between the two is that the European Commission contingency measures, uh, it, it covers a wider spectrum, while as the UK covers a narrower spectrum, just the UK parts. Um, I'm happy to take this up. If you just leave your email behind, I'm happy to, to double check for you, but um, key action 107, as we understand it right now, is not covered and the UK government the DfE, the Department for Education, is aware of this, and we are talking to them about getting some official lines, and hopefully, maybe get get it changed. But that's that's me, fingers crossed. Um, that's that's not an, that's nothing official. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, let's see. Probably a question for Bayes. Uh, is there any indication as to how a successor program uh, will be manufactured for the ERDF? Oh, sorry, managed, managed. Will funds continue to go to the regions or will they be managed by central government? Uh, I'm going to have to go away on that one and get back to you. <laughs> sorry, I don't have that specific knowledge to, to hand. No, that's fine. Francis, you maybe have thoughts or shall you Not take on that one? Sorry. Okay, so um, uh, I'm happy to take this up afterwards offline and when Anthony and Francis have an answer to that, happy to send it to you. Let's see, next question. Uh, will incoming Erasmus students to the UK be able to access Erasmus grants for 1920 and what about 2021 onwards? So yes, yeah, so because incoming Erasmus students uh, starting in September, they because we're still a member state, everything stays the same. So that should stay the same. If we then have a deal and we automatically go into a transition period, everything stays the same as well. So the Erasmus grants will keep coming. 
then again if we have a deal 2021 is also covered because it means that we're in the whole program uh, if we have a no deal situation then it would really depend on the underwrite and um, the, the Erasmus grants for students uh, coming to the UK would be something for the European Commission to decide and at the moment they only have this contingency measure of everyone abroad uh, is covered at that point um, but nothing more than that and they haven't made any announcements on whether or not they would extend that for a longer period of time. So I, I can't say anything about no deal situation 2021 onwards for EU students coming to the UK, unfortunately. Is it true that if I've been living in the UK for less than three years, I'm not eligible for student loan for studying for master's degrees? God, that's a very specific question. To be honest, I don't know, but I'm very happy to look this up for you and, and consult with my colleagues. Um, I would assume if you just, yeah, I can't, sorry, can't say anything about that at the moment. Um, I'm actually assuming that you would have the same rights and responsibilities as you'd always have, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't really be a problem, but I'm happy to email you about that and double check for you. Okay, that were all the questions. Um, well, then all that really uh, leaves me to do is to thank you all for joining us. And I'd really, really want to thank Francis for dialing in from Berlin. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And Gossier for dialing in from Brussels. Really, really appreciate it. And the Science and Innovation Network in general for just always working with us on these webinars. It's been absolutely brilliant working with you. And uh, yeah, just to repeat, the slides will be posted online. You will get the link to this webinar uh, afterwards. Uh, so you can watch it again if you like. Um, and of course, thank you to the listeners for tuning in every time. Uh, we really hope that these webinars have been helpful. That was really the whole goal of these webinars to try to keep you up to date. And like I said, if something changes and there would be a need for us to start them up again, we will. Uh, but for now, this, will, this was the last one. But thank you, everyone. And maybe see you next time.